This is a new day. This is a new day full of sound and light and expectation. This day has been waiting for you. This day has been waiting especially for you to embrace you, to guide you. This day has been waiting with open arms just for you. This is the day we have been given. Let's not waste it. Come now and let us worship together. Welcome, everybody. My name is Reverend Joseph Boyd. I welcome you here live to 1105 Elm Street. We are streaming our services across the country and now across the world. I welcome all our members from the local Mahoning County area. I welcome our friends and members in Trumbull County. I welcome our friends and members in Pennsylvania, a very critical state, in Hermitage and Meadville. I welcome our friends from coast to coast, from California to New York City, to Colorado, to South Carolina. I welcome our international friends in the Dominican Republic, in Brazil, in Europe, and beyond. In my humble opinion, we are a very special community. We are seeking to live with integrity and humility in this next millennium. And we are starting that this year, building on a history that goes back over a century of standing in solidarity with the marginalized. For over a decade, we have proudly waved a rainbow flag outside our sanctuary on Elm Street to signify this space and now this virtual space across the globe as a safe space for all LGBTQ plus persons. We have put on the face of our church a large Black Lives Matter banner to remind ourselves as a church community and all communities that ra racism and systems that support racism must transform if we are to become the beloved community. And as a church, we are committed to participating in that active transformation. We have many events coming up that I'd love to invite you to, even besides this Sunday worship service. But first, I want to say, if this is your first time viewing us, or if you haven't viewed us in a while, welcome. I know that these are very difficult times in the life of our country and the life of our world, and it's touched every citizen on this globe, this COVID-19 pandemic, as well as many of the other issues we are facing as a species. I have found great hope and satisfaction in this community, and I hope the same for you, and we would love to get to know you. So please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or to our church community. You're welcome to say hello down below in the chat box from wherever you happen to be in the country and the world, just so we can get to know you better and start a conversation. Beyond Sunday morning worship, I'd like to invite you into a conversation that's gonna happen on December 2nd. We have principles in this congregation that guide how we are together. We don't have a creed or a set of beliefs that you need to adhere to. We have principles that guide our behavior toward each other in this community. And one of those principles that we were talking about implementing at our annual meeting in January is a principle of committing ourselves to dismantling racism. And I'd love to join you to participate in that conversation. It's going to be December 2nd on Wednesday at 7 p.m. We had a conversation last Wednesday, which went really beautifully. And we'd love to invite you to participate if you haven't had the chance. December 2nd, Wednesday, 7 p.m. This is a note from Marguerite Felice about Big Brothers, Big Sisters, which is very important during this holiday season. And I'll just read it to you. This upcoming season is going to be a unique one in recent times. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot hold our annual holiday party for our families and their mentors, bigs. However, we are collecting gifts for our children, littles, as usual. Since we are not meeting in person at this church, and we will not have a giving tree as we usually do in our social hall, I am asking everyone who would like to to contribute gifts for our little ones and our families. And you can email Marguerite Felice at the email below. She's the Big Brothers Big Sister contact. 
She says, this year, because of the COVID-19 stress causing additional financial challenges for some of our families, we are also accepting gift cards for gas and groceries. Gifts will be collected December 1st through the 5th. And if you would like to join this, we found a way to give you a shopping list in a way that will be safe, directly sent to your home, so you won't have to have contact with any person. But it would be a big help to our families if you can pick up a shopping list and help some of these families during these very difficult times. So please contact Marguerite Felice down in the chat box before Thanksgiving, November 26th. I would also like to invite you to a very special teach-in that's happening now. Uh, some of you may not know, but our faith ancestors are directly connected to those first pilgrims that came off the Mayflower and off ships from England and then started congregational churches in the New England area, and then later those congregational churches became Unitarian churches. So we have a special opportunity and responsibility as a faith tradition to rethink and reorient ourselves around what Thanksgiving might mean for us this year and going forward. And to help us in that effort and to build energy, there is a teach-in for justice called Harvest the Power. It's happening now and going until Thanksgiving Day on November 26th. And we're having tribal elders from various tribal nations speak on panels with white allies about what it might mean for us to truly celebrate gratitude in a way that is holistic and honors First Peoples. It's free and open to everyone, and these events are happening daily. So if you'd love to be part of that, um, you just contact the office at office at uuyo.org, and we can send you that link so that you can join us. And today we have a very special guest I'd like to introduce, Deborah and Jasper Flint. And I am so grateful that they were able to join us this morning and offer their words for our chalice lighting. So let's go to their home. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we light this candle in memory of trans individuals across the globe who have experienced violence and death. The HRC reports erased by transphobic family members in a final act of toxic control, um, who use the trans person's dead name in order which life is lost um, in the trans experience, not being supported to fully live how you know you were born to be, not being able to find employment or housing because of who you are, not getting adequate health care because of transphobia and incompetence in the healthcare system, living in a society that often criminalizes trans experience. There are trans children in your neighborhood who are couch surfing because their transphobic parents evicted them. There are trans people in your neighborhood who are bullied at school and work. There are trans people living in Pennsylvania um, in a state of constant anxiety because they can be legally denied service at shops, restaurants, and by healthcare professionals. Trans people are also often told that God does not love them based on someone else's interpretation of religious teaching. We mourn the loss of life in its finality, as well as in the day-to-day life-killing moments that are so often experienced by our transgender siblings. We honor that trans women of color and black trans women are disproportionately affected by both transphobia and racism while simultaneously often being the most active organizers against both of these. Please join me in reciting the covenant of this church. 
Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Each month, we give to an organization that supports transformation in our community, which is the heart of our mission. In our church's historic commitment to the well-being of our community, we give 100% of our offering to those in need. UUYO's Giveaway the Plate recipient for November is the Midlothian Free Health Clinic. The Midlothian Free Health Clinic is located inside First Presbyterian Church of Youngstown and provides medical services to individuals in need of care. The clinic believes everyone has a right to quality medical care provided by health professionals who treat patients with dignity, respect, and compassion. The clinic believes patients are more than their disease. They are individuals with unique histories, values, and character. The clinic believes that medical providers must be more than technicians. They must be healers of the mind, body, and spirit. To treat only the physical illness will not solve the problem in the long run. The approach of the Midlothian Free Clinic centers on the fact that healing is a team effort and physicians, medical and non-medical staff and patients must all work together in order for healing to occur. The clinic provides hope for the hurt, healing for the suffering, medications for the sick, and treatment for people who are ill. The clinic is open the second and fourth Thursday evenings from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. In a time when access to medical care is so important, Youngstown is fortunate to have an organization like the Midlothian Free Health Clinic available to provide service and support to residents who need it. We will now receive the offering that supports the life of Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, and our wider world. Please join me in meditation. Wherever you happen to be, I know some of you may be laying down, comfortable. Some of you might be sitting up at your kitchen table. I know some of you like to listen while you're out and about walking or running around. Um, so wherever you are, whatever your position your body's in, um, just note your breathing and what it feels like just to breathe inside your body with all of us here across the world for a few moments.
Our reading today comes from a great poet, Naomi Shihab Nye, who wrote one of, my most one of the most beautiful poems I've ever read called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. I came across that Anne Lamott quote while clicking onto Facebook the other morning. Like many people, I am easing my way off Facebook, but I have uneasily made an exception for the many Facebook groups for actors and writers that I'm a part of which have been an invaluable source of community and connection for me during this time of pandemic where my industry, film, TV, and theater, has taken a massive hit. Anne Lamott's words popped up on my timeline as a memory, which is a Facebook feature where old posts that you had made over the years resurface as a memento, a kind of social media time capsule, if you will. I had apparently posted this quote on my Facebook timeline six years ago, and looking at it again, I was struck by its wisdom, perhaps even more than 2014 New York City living me had been when I had initially shared it with the virtual world. I think of myself, the circa 2014 New York City dwelling self, seeing fit to post this meaningful quote. I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us. And similar to Anne Lamott, I too don't fully comprehend the mystery of grace. For me, especially at this time of year, grace intuitively made me think of gratitude. A quick Google search confirmed that the word grace is in fact derived from the Latin word gratus or gratia, meaning Gratitude, grace and gratitude, thankfulness, kindness. To be met exactly where we are in all of our warts and glory with our fears, anxieties, hopes, and bruised edges 
met there, encountered there, but not left there. Left where? Anne's words imply that grace leaves us at a changed place, even a better, richer, or deeper, more true place than where we had just been standing. And so again, me, circa 2014, New York City dwelling, seeing fit to post this meaningful quote. I look at it today with my 2020 eyes, my 2020 vision, my Youngstown eyes. Grace had found me in New York City, met me where I was, an actor and budding filmmaker, and traveled with me all the way to Youngstown, Ohio, to be here sharing these words with you today, six years later. Before the pandemic hit, I was making plans to reinvigorate my acting career, to find funding and assistance in making my second film. I was going back and forth between New York City and Youngstown. Both cities are home. Both dwell within me as much as I dwell within them. I am grateful for the resilience of New York, its kindness, its inability to be beaten down without standing back up and proclaiming, I am New York and I am still here. I am grateful for my family and my lifelong friends in the city who open their arms to me on every returning visit and who I now get to stay connected with on Zoom. I am grateful for how the city brought Joseph and I together an Oregonian and a small town girl from upstate New York who met in a basement acting class and forged our way to wind up here in Youngstown. The grace of Youngstown has frankly astounded me. Talk about resilient. Abandoned buildings that in other cities would be left to decay are now housing startups, co-ops, city services, and beautification projects. The haunting beauty of Mill Creek Park with its owls, deer, and other forest wildlife forming an unusual chorus with the motorcycles and cool vintage cars touring the park roads during weekends in nice weather. And this church, the grace of this congregation who have invited, supported, and encouraged both Joseph and I to be our best selves here. I'm so grateful for your open hearts, your dedication to this beautiful building, to each other, to social and environmental justice, and to the city who so desperately needs and receives your kindness. During any other year, I, and I assume many of us, would be making plans for a sit-down Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends. I would be shopping and getting ready for a feast of vegan holiday dishes and perhaps a visit to a farm animal sanctuary to witness the celebration for the turkeys, which is a Thanksgiving tradition where rescued turkeys get to enjoy their favorite foods rather than become food. This year, we are being advised by trusted health authorities to gather over Zoom, not in person, to give thanks together virtually during this holiday season. This year, the rescued turkeys will also be celebrated virtually, and Joseph and I will be cooking our favorite dishes in the safety of our own home, just the two of us. But we won't be alone. Grace is meeting us here, where we are, exactly where we are. Grace is meeting us here, but not leaving us here. Even without leaving our homes, we can feel grace's transformative power. We can do good, receive good. We can meet and be met by acts of grace, of kindness, of thanksgiving. And for that, I am grateful. Thank you. 
Joy Harjo is an indigenous poet, writer, and activist, and this is her poem, Perhaps the World Ends Here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it, Babies, teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor, falling-down selves, and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of that last sweet bite. The world begins here, on this day, with all of us in our beautiful, shiny faces right here. I think we are always beginning if we give ourselves that opportunity. And I want to give us that opportunity this morning to truly begin. It's been a hard year, and I know many are anxious about the next two months as winter arrives, and we are being recommended by public health experts not to gather in person with our loved ones. I, like Joy Harjo, believe that the world begins at a kitchen table at a place where we are sustained, warmed, and fed. Fed by each other's sweetness. Fed by each other's company. Fed by each other's surprises. Fed by each other's sorrows. Fed by each other's joys. I believe there is a sweetness in life, and together we experience that. We are at a place of new beginnings in many ways in this nation and in this world. For the last decade especially, there have been annual reminders that the myth of Thanksgiving, the myth of the Thanksgiving story, is not just untrue, but harmful. But I think this is just the tip of the iceberg of false narratives and false myths. I think we are discovering that many of the stories, many of the myths that we put our faith in, in this nation in particular, have held us back from the sweetness that is available to all of us. If we but just open our eyes and are willing to make that real together right here on this day. 
Myths are meant to open up our imagination and let us live a larger and more complete life together. They're supposed to be true to the experience of being alive, true to the experience of endings, and yes, true to the experience of beginnings. This year, I have never heard so much curiosity about wanting to learn which tribes occupied the lands where our houses are, where our schools are, where our church is, and the land that it occupies. Next week, our worship service will answer some of those questions about the First Peoples and the land they occupied where we now worship together. Often the sweetness of life comes from recognizing what is right under our feet, what is literally right in front of us and has been right in front of us for millennia, but has been covered up or missed. This is a time when we are discovering what is right in front of us. And many of us are growing more curious about who we really are, why things are the way they are, and what we might do about that. This year is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower. It's also another year where we hear the old myth of Thanksgiving, the old myth, the false narrative that was about justifying taking something which never really belonged to us. It was a story that literally whitewashed desperation, hunger, and forced removal from land for the sake of an idealized but ultimately unreal sense of unity. So I ask all of us a very important question this morning, a question that I hope that our lives can live into. And this is the question. What is real unity? What does that look like? What is real unity with the first peoples of this nation? What is real unity with our trans siblings that are disproportionately impacted by violence? What is real unity with each other in this virtual world that we are now in, in the COVID-19 pandemic? What is real unity during these political times and upheavals? What is real unity? I was shown an article in the New York Times from last Wednesday, and it was an article called Revisiting the Thanksgiving Myth. And there was a response by Dana Thompson, an award-winning chef and owner of the Sioux Chef, an avenue for reclaiming claiming and revitalizing indigenous cuisine. She said something which really struck me. She said, quote, the true indigenous wisdom that is behind the philosophy of Thanksgiving, it's about not taking, but giving back. It's about not taking and giving back. I think that is a brilliant response. I think it's a response to how we might find our way to true unity as a people. And it does have two parts that are equally important. One is not taking. Not taking not taking what is not given, not using force or aggression to take what we believe is ours and is owed to us. 
not taking. And the second, giving back. Giving back. So I invite us this morning into an exploration of how these two tenets may guide us this Thanksgiving holiday into a practice of true unity and gratitude. Personally, I am grateful to not take for granted that I am alive. I'm alive. And I'm alive with all of you. I am grateful for the willingness to not find refuge in false myths this year, but real myths that give us the opportunity to create and begin again. I am grateful to not take unnecessary risk this Thanksgiving by staying in our house, Jennifer and I, cooking a meal together, and taking time to Zoom with our friends and our loved ones. I am grateful to not have to take matters into my own hands, but to trust medical and public health expertise that says that we need to stay especially vigilant for the sake of the well-being of our community and our nation. I am grateful for the intention not to take pleasure at the expense of others, including First Peoples, but to allow their experience to touch my life and to impact how I might choose to live my life. I am grateful for the reminder I receive every week from all of you to not take this life for granted, but to pay attention to it, to care for it with tenderness and imagination. I am grateful for the opportunity to offer you my words this morning, and I hope it may be of benefit to at least some of you. I'm grateful to give my attention to this time that we're living in, and finding sweetness while not neglecting the whole of life, which includes sorrow and loss. I'm grateful to give back in word, thought, and deed to all the people that have made my life possible and sustained me each and every single day, many of whom I will never know by their first name all the hands that bring food to my table, all the people I meet who stretch me into becoming more kind, all the people like yourself who teach me and encourage me to live my life with more integrity. I'm grateful to give back some of the kindness I've received in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. I'm grateful for the curiosity among many of our members of this church who inspire me to find ways we can honor First Peoples on whose land that we worship on. I'm grateful to give back to a church community that is seeking to live with integrity and humility in the next millennium. Our lives were not meant for taking. They were not meant for taking. They were meant for giving. This is a very deep teaching. What does it look like for us as individuals in our life to practice not taking? What does it look like? What does it feel like to give back? Often I find the most powerful ways we can give back is simply by offering our presence to each other, just like this. Being present with the intention of kindness, showing up with those that we know and whose faces we recognize, 
and with those that we don't and who we have the chance to get to know. When we have enough awareness to pause from the need to take from life and instead see what we can give, I believe we naturally find our way to to the sweetness that is inherent to living. Thanks to technology during this pandemic, our kitchen table now has the opportunity to span the entire globe. It spans the entire nation from coast to coast. Our kitchen table literally transcends time zones. Perhaps the world ends here, just like this. Or perhaps this is just the beginning. I really think it is the latter. I don't believe in definite final endings, but I do believe in beginnings. And I think the beginning we need starts with not taking and giving, giving back. Have a safe and healthy Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you're able in your own way to find the true meaning of this holiday. Gratitude that comes from not taking. Gratitude that comes from giving back. I hope you find the joy in this season of giving back to that which sustains and makes your life truly sweet. Be safe and be well. Please pray with me. Spirit of love, we are grateful for the opportunity to rediscover the power of gratitude in this season. As we do that, please help us to remember that the cloth of kindness is large, as Nahomi Shihab Nye writes. Please help us to include in our kindness all our trans siblings this season and in every season. Please help us to include in our awareness First Peoples, During this season, please be with those who are on the verge of sorrow or who are anxious and uncertain about what they might do. Please guide us to take care of our health, to take care of our well-being, and in so doing, take care of the well-being of a nation and a world. All this we pray. Amen. this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts until we meet again.
As you depart, please remember the one great fact. You are loved and never truly alone.